This is Rory Spiegel and Ryan Radecki, and this is the Annals of Emergency Medicine podcast. It is February 2021, and we are back again for another great month. Ryan, how are you doing over there in New Zealand? Can't say much has changed. We're still COVID-free. Yeah, you're COVID-free, and you know I can see you now. So for the listeners, we, we usually record this podcast with Zencaster, and there's no video. And they've updated their software, and now there's kind of they now have a video component to it, so I, I'm staring into Ryan's face, which is a little bit disconcerting because what it's been like it's been over a year since we've actually seen each other, and we've done this podcast from the start without ever seeing each other, right? Except for the two times we did it live. Speaking of starting this podcast, it's been five years now. It has. You're right. This month is your anniversary. I started a month early, but it has been five years. Five years of the Roy and Ryan show. So thank you all for sticking with us, and growing with us, and learning with us. And speaking of learning with us, shall we get into it? Let's do it. All right. First article from this issue that we're going to talk about is called Effect of Implementing the Out-of-Hospital Traumatic Brain Injury Treatment Guidelines, Excellence in Pre-Hospital Injury Care for Children Study, which they have abbreviated EPIC for kids. Lead author is Joshua Gaitler, and they are at the Arizona Emergency Medicine Research Center, College of Medicine, Phoenix. This is their rather massive report on the outcomes that they observed in Arizona from their rollout of this guideline recommended algorithm for pre-hospital care for children with traumatic brain injury. This algorithm is based on some guidelines issued back in 2008, and they call it Epic for Kids, and it's fairly straightforward with face validity. Generally speaking, it involves attending closely to the things that we know are bad for kids with traumatic brain injury, hypoxia, and hypotension with additional efforts to prevent hyperventilation. Their report in this issue covers the years between 2007 and 2015, documenting their before and after outcomes as their paramedic agencies transitioned from their old practices, were trained on the algorithm, and put the new algorithm into work. The before cohort here, analyzed in the pre-implementation phase, includes 2,041 children, and the after post-implementation phase has 760. And unfortunately, the overall conclusion is super muddy. As you can imagine, with so many individual factors at play, EMS agencies involved, rural areas versus urban locations, and confounders from hospital care, it's extraordinarily challenging to pull anything conclusive out of these data. The two outcomes upon which they focus are survival to hospital admission and survival to hospital discharge. And to present the challenge you have in discerning much difference in raw numbers, 96% of children survived a hospital admission in the pre-intervention phase as compared with 97% of children in the post-intervention phase. So before you even get started, you can see it's not surprising the authors found no statistical difference in either of these main outcomes. And any further exploration of any subjects is similarly aspirational. The best I can probably even say from these data, and even this is more optimism biasing my pre-study odds, is that it's unlikely from these data that their algorithm that they've implemented as described is harming children. <laughs> However, since it's a bundle of care, it's not clear which of these various elements that they've put into place is actually the best one to focus upon in your pre-hospital training considering training hours are a finite resource. So overall, they found a small bit of improvement, but again, didn't reach statistical significance because the absolute differences are so small, but it's probably not harming children to implement these guidelines for pre-hospital care in traumatic brain injury. Yeah, I think I think that's fair. I, you know, they, they focused a little on some of their, their subsets, which showed a statistically significant survival. Like you said, I think I don't think you can use that to say anything meaningful. You know, the data is before and after. There's many subsets. If you look at the actual plots, they're all over the map. And so this is most likely statistical noise. That being said, you know, in the end, what they said is don't let them become hypoxic and don't let them become hypotensive, which are reasonably good statements. I, I want to know what they were doing before, you know, the implementation of the guideline. Because I think that one of the one areas we have reasonably good data is pre-hospital definitive airway management it is somewhat harmful in kids with TBI. So maybe simply implementing this and moving more towards you know more conservative management as far as bagging the patient and doing uh, airway maneuvers and using non-invasive techniques could be beneficial. But like you said, it's really hard to actually take anything you know definitive from this study. 
Yeah. And I mean, sometimes just creating a structured instrument that's sort of almost like a checklist to go down, you know, just go through, cycle cycle through it throughout the transport. Are they hypotensive? Are they hypoxic? If we're managing their airway, are we, you know, we do have a timer on there to make sure we're not hyperventilating them. You can put things in there, you know, to make sure that you're conforming to the guidelines as written. I do like, you know, if they're hypotensive, give them 20 cc's per kg fluid bolus and repeat until not hypotensive what if it doesn't work <laughs> you know it's fairly hopeful <laughs> Just forever it always works <laughs> yeah but i mean again nearly like 90 plus percent of these kids are surviving so they're already doing quite well it's a large sample size you know they were talking about 2700 kids but not very many of them are like are seriously injured and having bad outcomes so again you did have a larger sample size and maybe even randomized to different elements of this bundle if there's a way to you know, break out the bundle elements to really figure out what to focus on. Because again, like I said, training hours for pre-hospital care are limited. You can't spend all your time training people on pre-hospital care for uh, head injured children without sacrificing some other training for adults or something else. Of course, though I would argue the don't let them get hypoxic, don't let them get a hypotensive is pretty universal to adults and children. I think you could probably train that globally. <laughs> Our next article is Management and Outcomes of Children with Nursemaid Elbows, and lead author is Katya Janotri. You know, nursemaid elbows are some of the most gratifying reductions we do in the emergency department, and it's one of the few things that you can kind of look like a magician. You've got a kid who's like holding their arm in pain, and, and you just kind of twist it quickly, and it, all of a sudden it resolves. And rarely do you ever have to do an x-ray post-reduction. But the question is, how often do we miss fractures in these children that we think they have a simple radial head dislocation, and really they, they have something more? And so these authors sought to assess the incident of fractures and if there were any clinical factors that would help us predict which kids were at higher risk for them. And they queried the Pediatric Health Information System database, which is an administrative database that contains inpatient ED, ambulatory surgery, and observational encounters through 52 nonprofit freestanding children's hospitals in the United States. So they examined visits of children younger than 10 years who are discharged with a diagnosis of radial head subluxation at 45 pediatric emergency departments from 2010 to 2018. Children who were hospitalized or died on the index visit transferred to another institute who had a concurrent diagnosis of an upper extremity or clavicle fracture at this index visit were excluded from their analysis. During their nine-year study period, they identified a total of 88,466 visits. The incidence of radial head subluxation was highest, not surprisingly, in children age one to three. And diagnosis after the age of five, again, not surprisingly, was fairly rare. Upper extremity radiography was performed in 28.5% of the patients, and it was most often used for children less than one year old or children greater than four years old. And the use of radiography varied widely from institute to institute. Return visits for an upper extremity fracture that was missed on the first visit within the next seven days was incredibly rare. 247 children of all, that's 0.3%. The incident of missed fracture was highest in children aged greater than six. Not surprisingly, that was about close to 1%. The most common site of missed fracture was the elbow, followed by the forearm, followed by the shoulder clavicle, followed by the humeral shaft, and then finally the hands or fingers. Among the 247 children with missed fractures, about 54% had radiography done on their index visit. And so then the authors tried to dive in to figure out, you know, with multivariate regression, which clinical factors actually predicted kids who would have a missed fracture. And what they found was kids greater than six were at higher risk for a mid missed fracture compared to ones who, who were one to three. Other factors that might have had a little higher risk were if say, someone did an upper extremity radiograph, which again kind of points that the clinician had some suspicion, if they were given pain medication like acetaminophen or ibuprofen, or Hispanic individuals also had any. This is a large study. It's a retrospective data set, and it would have missed children who returned to emergency departments or their primary care physician outside of this network. And there was such a small number of fractures, so it's hard to make a really, to take anything more than the fact that, you know, most of these kids are going to be fine. The rate of fracture is fairly rare, and kids who are older are at higher risk of a fracture because at that point they shouldn't really be having a, a radial head dislocation. The other part I found was interesting is approximately half the kids with a missed fracture had an x-ray done on their first admission. So getting an x-ray doesn't necessarily protect you. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the funny thing. is like if you're just as likely to miss a fracture if you get an x-ray as if you don't. 
then what's the point of getting the x-ray? Because if you're missing half the fractures, then you know, just let time tell you whether you have a fracture or not. If the child's moving its arm appropriately and doing everything that seems clinically appropriate, which is kind of hard to measure in a one-year-old or a one-and-a-half-year-old or a two-year-old who just had their radial head subluxed, it's just one of those things. You, know, you can either do x-rays on 300 children or tell 300 parents to bring their child back if it doesn't seem like they're using their arm appropriately over the next couple days. We're talking about there's no difference in long-term outcomes. I mean, these children are not disabled or dead because you've missed a small fracture in their elbow at the same time you reduce their nursemaids. They will just have a, a delay in diagnosis with no sequelae. So it's a lot higher value and a lot less insane to just tell people, if your child's not moving their arm the way they're supposed to, they need to see somebody and follow up. Right, you can imagine they probably even missed a few more fractures that the kid did fine. You know, they went home, they had a, they had the dislocation reduced, they went home, they had a small fracture but moved their arm and, and never saw follow-up, right? And so you probably have more missed fractures than what was seen here. But like you said, they probably don't make a clinical difference. And so in the end, I think it's just good follow-up discharge instructions. Yeah, I mean, supracondylar fractures are inherently unstable, but you know, radial head fractures and electronon fractures are pretty pretty stable. A lot of those are managed unoperatively, and they're not necessarily even immobilized. It's sort of a sling, and like you can get a child who's one to two years old to wear a sling anyways. And pediatric bones, if they're in the same room, they heal up anyways, as we're going to find out in the next you know, study we're going to talk about. We're talking about this study because 28% of kids get radiography for their nursemaids, and we're saying that basically, unless there's... A, specific reason to get one that you're suspicious because something is screaming at you on the physical examination just don't or they're older you know six-year-olds probably shouldn't have a nursemaid's elbow yeah we're talking about the the extremes 90 percent of the kids who fall into the typical nursemaids do not need an x-ray you go down three percent on the index visit down to five to ten percent and that's probably appropriate all right well why don't we move on yeah, yeah. Speaking of, we're just going to keep on doing children's fractures here. There's another article in this issue called Home Management versus Primary Care Physician Follow-Up of Children with Distal Radius Buckle Fractures, a randomized controlled trial. And the lead author here is Keith Kalako, and they are at the Hospital for Sick Children at the University of Toronto. And yep, this is the, just us from the school of don't do anything, just stand there. I mean, what does a buckle fracture of the distal radius really even need as far as downstream health resources? Virtually all these fractures do well. They're utterly stable fractures, and children's bones will just heal up without deformity unless they're grossly displaced. So what value are we really adding by having any kind of follow-up with a physician or an orthopedist or anything? So these authors hypothesized none, (laughs) and they randomized children to either follow up with a primary care provider, not an orthopedist, versus nothing. All the children in the study receive a soft, prefabricated wrist splint. Instructions are to wear the splint for one week and then as needed after that first week in case there's pain or swelling after that time. Half of the cohort was recommended to follow up in one to two weeks with primary care and the rest on just an as needed basis. 149 children were enrolled and most had the fracture of interest. Well, 20 didn't actually have distal radius buckle fractures. Instead, they had green stick fractures or Salter Harris 2 fractures or no fracture at all because this is based on sort of the initial emergency physician read. About three quarters of those with radial buckle fractures also had ulnar fractures. And then ultimately, along with all of those lost to follow up and those crossovers and those patients excluded with uh, different kinds of fractures, the final analyses included 133 children for the intention to treat and 114 for the PER protocol. Their primary outcome was a measure of return to activities for kids. And as you might expect, and because it's a small trial, there was no difference between the groups. And there really wasn't a difference between groups, although the confidence intervals remain wide. The main difference between the two groups was with respect to healthcare costs and estimates of financial impact on parents from taking time off work to follow up. Actual dollar amounts are somewhat unimportant because the costs of care aren't generalizable across countries, but there are clearly fewer primary care visits, fewer radiographs, and fewer orthopedic consultations, and less time off work if you are randomized to a cohort which is recommended to not follow up unless as needed. So, please, when you see a distal radius buckle fracture, with or without an ulnar fracture, in kids, just put them in a soft removable splint and let them go on their merry way with open-ended follow-up. Yeah, I think this is huge. I mean, this is such a change in practice that, that initially seems so little. Like, but, you know, downstream for the parents, it's a big deal. And, and you know, often, you know, the parents go to the primary care visit and 
primary care physician takes the splint off, moves their arm around and says goodbye. You can do that yourself at home with good instruction. So uh, <laughs> I think this is somewhat of a game changer. It really is. And, and, you know, if you had asked any of us before then, I think many of us would have said, yeah, of course, this makes sense, right? Because like you said, you know, as long as the two bones are, are in the same room on a kid's arm, it'll heal up. But now we actually have some pretty good evidence saying this. Yeah, I mean, it's not like the, the rest of the world, which uh, without modern healthcare is these kids with horribly deformed arms from their buckle fractures growing up. I mean, yeah, there's plenty of the world that does not have ready access to radiographs. Yeah, like in, unless you got run over by a truck, you know, usually your arm works just fine. Yeah, kids heal up. There's a reason why the human body has evolved uh, the way it has, because kids fall down, they, they bend their bendable bones, and they, then they, they, they heal right back up. Did you require pediatric orthopedic surgery as a child for your non-bendable bones? No, 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 no. I, uh... Good, good. So our next article is the effect of medical scribes on throughput, revenue, and patient and provider satisfaction, a systematic review and meta-analysis. And the lead author is Michael Gottlieb. I think most of us find the documentation requirements in our jobs become more and more burdensome year after year. And I don't think any of us went into emergency medicine to write lots of notes. I know I didn't. And scribes have been proposed as a means of offloading some of this burden. But how much benefit do they really provide? And that's a big question. So these authors conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis attempting to answer this question. They conducted a search, including retrospective case control, cohort, prospective observational, and quasi-randomized or randomized controlled trials comparing new subscribes to no scribes. They identified a total of 1,088 studies. Of these, 39 were included in their final the quality of data was fairly variable. Only five of these studies were randomized controlled trials, while the rest were prospective, non-randomized studies, retrospective studies, or kind of a, a mixture of both. And what the authors found, patients treated per hour increased from 1.95 without scribes to 2.25 with one. Scribes also increased at RVU per counter and RVU per hour, but they found that time to disposition and length of stay did not increase with the use of scribes. They went on to talk about provider satisfaction, and seven of the trials reported a higher level of satisfaction when the provider had described them when they didn't, whereas two showed no difference. Seven studies also reported a favorable patient satisfaction when scribes were used, versus 11 studies which indicated no difference between the two. And so, you know, this data analysis was fairly heterogeneous and at times poor quality. They only identified three studies with sound methodology. But when they performed a sensitivity analysis to kind of compensate for these evidentiary shortcomings, they didn't really see any change in their results. There was an editorial published alongside this by Katie Walker and Heather Heaton, and they wrote a really nice summary of the controversies surrounding the use of scribes. Essentially, for scribes to be financially viable, they have to improve flow, improve physician productivity, and increase per patient revenue. They go on to describe the major gaps in the literature, stating that the deficits in scribe research include do scribes actually improve quality and safety or do, or do they potentially harm it? They all go on to say it's unclear whether scribes improve physician burnout or even reduce the administrative burden as there's a lot of administrative work done by emergency physicians after a shift is complete that's not captured by these studies. Overall, I think this was a fairly done meta-analysis that highlights the lack of great quality data examining this area or this subject. Will scribes go on to solve all the problems facing emergency men? No. Do they offload some of the administrative burden on emergency physicians? Maybe. Even that, I think, is a little unclear given the data we have. Yeah, I mean, this is a study that basically tells us what the market has already told us. Scribes wouldn't exist as a thriving market if there weren't some desire to have them in your medical clinic or in your emergency department. You know, scribes, for whatever reason, are perceived to improve satisfaction and decrease the amount of documentation you have. And you know, then this reflects that in the small amount of weak evidence that we have. It's great that we get to talk about how this role of a scribe adds like zero value to patient outcomes and like the healthcare complex. It's a reflection of the additional clerical and administrative burden on physicians that's just of no value to our to healthcare delivery. So, yeah, and I, I don't think that is meaningless. I think that's an important thing. I think scribes, when done right, definitely does like reduce your administrative burden and, and increase your, your quality of work. And when done wrong, it actually can increase your, your administrative burden and, and, and make things more painful and difficult for you. So I think it's complex. I almost think the, the outcomes that they measure, patient length of stay and so forth, are probably the wrong outcomes because, like you said, like 
maybe they can improve that. But the reason we really do it is because, you know, it, it's a part of our job, which is, you know, terribly painful and, and a larger and larger component of what we do. And, and, and having scribes offload that may lead to less burnout and, and less uh, uh, clinician dissatisfaction. Yeah. And I, I, my point is that you know, the fact that we have to have this entire you know, complex of scribe companies because the clerical needs on physicians is becoming so great that it's burning us out and reducing our productivity is something that we should probably better reflect upon in our healthcare delivery models, as opposed to just adding more and more administrative burden on the clinicians and finding, you know, new ways to put bandages over that like scribes, which we all know it's, you know, it's, the, it's basically the elephant in the room they talk about in this editorial. It's just rather amazing that the scribes, they've integrated themselves so nicely into healthcare without us ever questioning why they are needed. Right. So you, you spent less than a year in New Zealand and, and you've already like, you know, get to the underlying problem. <laughs> <laughs> so un-American of you. We just want to slap a bandy on it. So little value added by so many steps that, that we adhere to for quote-unquote quality. All right. Well, we could, we could probably whine about the American healthcare system for a long time here, but we're going to go on to something entirely different. Also in this issue, the article, Use of Machine Learning to Develop a Risk Stratification Tool for Emergency Department Patients with Acute Heart Failure. The lead author here is Dana Sachs, and they are with the Permanente Medical Group out of Northern California. So, would you like to predict heart failure outcomes? Well, of course you would, because there's reimbursement tied to it. Would you like to use a black box to do so? <laughs> well, then you've come to the right place, because this is not the only heart failure adverse outcome model to come out recently. Things like the Ottawa Heart Failure Prediction Instrument have been covered on this podcast before, as well as regression-based models like Stratify published elsewhere. So this is yet another one. And the key is these authors hypothesize that rather simply using the limited variables from those other prediction instruments and instead supplementing with additional information from the electronic health record. So using 26,189 emergency department encounters for acute heart failure as determined by coded diagnoses, as well as some natural language processing and inference, that is what they did. And they did just a little better, to be specific, where the base model had an area under the curve for prediction accuracy of 0.76. They were able to boost the AUC to 0.80 just with logistic regression by supplementing additional variables from the electronic health record, and then the AUC to 0.85 with their highest performing machine learning model, an XG boost based model. And of course, you're all familiar with XG boost. <laughs> which is, <laughs> well, it's a lot like Random Forest, which was their second best performing machine learning model, which if you're not familiar with Random Forest is just a supercharged decision tree. So it's a decision tree, except then you make lots and lots and lots of decision trees. And then you use special techniques to pull the predictions from the best performing decision trees. And then you use some extra techniques to try and prevent overfitting. So pruning the number of trees that you've made, adding accounting for missing information in different ways. So XG Boost is kind of a couple years ago, it was like the new hottest way of doing predictions. And if you've ever been on like Kaggle or one of the other sort of informatics prediction sort of, because these prediction models are used for lots and lots of applications outside of medicine, they actually have competitions on how to predict things. And Kaggle is one of the sites for which they do that. XG Boost was one of the highest performing models on Kaggle. So it's a good choice for using sort of tabular formatted data like this. So anyways, not surprising that XG Boost is the best <laughs> from a clinical informatics standpoint. So in any event, yes, it's an incremental improvement in predicting the future of patients presenting with acute heart failure if you have this rich data set of structured information available. The harder part, as we've talked about many times on this podcast, of these algorithms is what to actually do with them clinically. There's nothing specifically prescriptive about discovering someone's elevated potential 30-day risk for poor outcome with heart failure. Nothing mandates hospitalization specifically because of the output of any prediction or scoring mechanism. However, it is probably reasonable to use these models to look at those patients falling into the lowest risk categories for 30-day outcomes and considering what value the hospitalization might offer. As these authors did look back and they did find that there were a certain number of these patients who were in the lowest risk categories who still had observation or hospital admissions. There's nothing in this model that tells us whether they were appropriate or inappropriate. Looking retrospectively, there could have been social determinants of care or other complicating factors. But this is one potential application of these models is to supplement your clinical gestalt on whether somebody's going to do well in the next 30 days or requires hospitalization. 
Yeah, I mean, how many times have we done machine learning <laughs> on this podcast? You know, and you know, initially thought to be the holy grail, and then shows that it shows you know minor improvements in, in an area under the curve that probably have no real clinical benefit or, or, or minimal change in clinical benefit. And, and like you said, none of this answers the bigger question, which is what do you do with this information in the end? Does this really tell you who you need to admit or not? Because does admitting these patients really change their outcome? And it doesn't really get into the granularity of the patients because you're right, like so much of what happens when why you admit some of these patients has nothing to do with their risk of decompensation and so much more to do with the social determinants of health. Are they out of their medication? Do they have someone they can follow up with? So on and so forth, which is, you know, a lot harder to pull and predict from insurance. Someday. And, and I'm, I'm not sure why heart failure is so specifically popular. It must be because it's got, you know, it has, it's tied to reimbursement, probably. And it, it is a high 30 day readmission thing. So, from a reimbursement standpoint, perhaps from like a quality measure standpoint, they're really interested in finding who's going to have the highest readmission rates and putting interventions in place for them. But again, there's nothing prescriptive here that teaches you what to do. Whereas, you know, from an emergency room standpoint, where we want to safely send home as many people as possible, we're kind of interested in the the other end of people, the people who are unlikely to require admission. So you have this tension. <laughs> we want to send people home, but they also, but then the hospital also wants to identify the people who are at highest risk for readmission. But even then, the highest risk cohorts are still only 20 to 30%. Right. So it's not like the specificity of any of these rules is, is not that great either. I don't think the salvation is going to be come in, you know, devising a new smarter machine learning program. I think the salvation is going to be in building a primary care system that allows for being able to take these patients who have no acute needs and be able to discharge them safely where somewhere they can get the proper care and what they need. And so emergency physicians feel okay about letting them leave the emergency department. And then accepting that these are sick patients and some of them are going to have to come back in the next 30 days. That's what happens in a cohort of patients who are fairly sick. There's no money for private equity and investing in good primary care follow-up. There's good, There's money in investing in predictive analytic startups. <laughs> this is the man who just talked about, you know, moved to New Zealand and just talked about identifying why we need scribes in medicine in the first place. And now all of a sudden, <laughs> we can't do the same. Why would we need machine learning to predict outcomes in patients when we can simply get them the follow-up that they deserve and need? All right, so our, our final article today is Retrospective Review of Pregnant Patients Presenting for the Evaluation of Acute Neurological Complaints, and the lead author is Leslie Belilo. Obviously, patients presenting to the emergency department with pregnancy and number of complaints, emergency physicians are, are, are always worried that you know a, a pregnant patient is somewhat different from all the other patients we see, and obviously we're taking care of two patients, so there's a lot more stress involved in those evaluations. And these authors look specifically at outcomes of patients who were pregnant presenting with neurological complaints. They conducted a seven-year retrospective chart review of pregnant patients presenting to a single emergency department with the chief complaint that was a neurological in origin. So they looked at patients who are female, aged 18 years or older, who are currently pregnant, who presented from January 1st, 2010 to May 31st, 2017. And overall, they identified 205 patients throughout this period who were pregnant and presented with a neurological complaint. Headache was the most common neurological complaint, followed by dizziness, seizure, and neck pain. Most of these patients had a normal neuro exam on chart review, and about 14% had some abnormal finding on their neuro exam. And these were most often altered mental status at 5.9%, uh, visual loss, and focal weakness. Of the whole cohort, 28.8% had radiographic imagery done. And out of those, only five patients, or 2.5% of the total study population, had something on radiographic imaging. Now, interesting thing, out of those five patients, four of them had a normal neurological exam and only one had an abnormality on their neuro exam. So, you know, like all retrospective chart reviews, it certainly has its faults. The big ones being, you know, you can only talk about what was documented in the chart itself. And so, you know, your neuro exam is basically dictated by what's in the chart. So even though most of the patients who had neuroimaging had a normal neuro exam, the emergency physician may have seen something or noticed something that wasn't documented but led them to get neuroimaging. It can be a, a little uh, misleading from that standpoint. The other thing is this is a single compartment. And so, you know, while most of these patients didn't have neuroimaging and we claimed that they were sent home and did fine, 
you don't know that for sure, as they could have presented to an outside hospital with some outcome that would have been missed from the study. So that standpoint, saying that, you know, there is safety in this, it's a little unclear. I think the big take home points are her most of these patients are going to be okay. A normal neuro exam doesn't completely say that the patient's safe. But if you look at the five patients in table three who had a negative outcome, you look at a four out of the five of them had a pretty obvious, or from their description, pretty obvious descriptions that they probably need imaging. So the first one being a thunderclap headache, I think most of them pregnant or not would go on to get imaging concerning for subarachnoid. That is indeed what they had. The second one had focal weakness. The third one had pain or swelling in their face. And then the the fourth one had facial numbness and weakness. So all of these are fairly obvious kind of presentations that would make us think that we probably need further imaging. The last one simply described as a headache, but it didn't really get into the quality of the headache. So it's a little unclear why this patient needed imaging. I I think the big take home much, despite the limitations of the study, is that pregnant patients with neurological presentations or neurological complaints should be evaluated like any other patient. And this study doesn't really have the strength or quality that says that we should kind of change our work up simply because. Of yeah, I mean, the other thing that this article doesn't talk about is, so this is a tertiary care center. This is, this is Harvard Medical School. They talk about 28% of the people who presented in this study undergoing imaging with non-contrast MRI being the most common modality. What's the rest of their population doing for, you know, uh, this? How, how, many, how frequently is neuroimaging used in the rest of their population? How much, how, how is this different? Because I don't think most of us are doing non-contrast MRI as our most frequent, you know, modality in up to a quarter of our patients. So I think there's a big generalizability issue here. And I don't really buy their takeaway of, you know, you must have this high index of suspicion or constant vigilance is required. You have to be an emergency physician and evaluate the complaints in front of you appropriately. Pregnant women with headaches do not need neuroimaging unless it's a specific kind of headache. Pregnant women with, you know, nonspecific numbness and vertigo don't need neuroimaging unless it's a specific kind of red flaggy numbness, vertigo, weakness, etc. I wouldn't go too far down the rabbit hole with this article and increase your index of suspicion by any stretch of the imagination. It's just like any other headache. If it doesn't get better or develops new features, it needs to follow up, it needs to return. Right. I think that's exactly it. The, the, the kick home here is the, the same red flags that would make you concerned with any form of headache, any form of neck pain, any form of neurological symptoms should stand whether the patient's pregnant or not. This study doesn't suggest that pregnant patients are necessarily at an increased risk of badness. And not only that, but their increased risk of badness is cryptogenic and that you can't tell simply by looking at a patient and making a clinical decision. All right. So I think that wraps us up for another month. It was a lot of fun. We enjoyed talking to you. We've enjoyed talking to you for the last five years. Because I started in January and Ryan started in February, we kind of give you guys two months of our anniversary. From now on, we'll just stick with February so we don't expose you to our... (laughs) our yearly bi-monthly discussion of how long we've been here but thank you all for listening as always with any comments or concerns we can be reached at annals audio at asap.org and until next month this was rory speaking on ryan and decky and this was the annals of emergency medicine podcast